Hi, good evening. Good evening. Hi. Right, okay. Um, I uh, was waiting for some time until the meeting starts. Right now, we all are here. Uh, and today's the last session okay 12th session of this module and we are going to finalize our discussions wind up uh, the discussions on the topics available okay today itself so if you have anything to be asked you can use today's time right uh, because after this i will not be meeting you to discuss this module i will be meeting you with another module but not for this right so if you have anything today itself you can get uh, it clarified from the from me of course during the discussions right okay hope you got the point uh, okay then uh, let me share my screen to the previous discussion of course previous uh, during the previous session, I started to uh, talk about uh, grammatical categories, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, please give me one second. One second, right. So, until uh, you... Wait. Um, until I start the discussion on grammatical categories, now already you have the note. Okay, I have shared the note. Uh, this uh, the note on grammatical categories and also the note on semantics right i'm going to touch on semantics as well today so please check with your materials and go through them and give me two minutes right okay i'm there uh, but i need uh, one or two minutes right Okay, I'm back. Right. Okay. Right. Can you all hear me? I didn't. Yes, I, I didn't yes, hear anything from you. Hope. Uh, yeah. Everybody can hear me clearly. Right. Uh, Okay, this is the present discussion is on grammatical categories. I think we started to talk about this. Right? Can you remember uh, the discussion on grammatical categories? We started to talk and uh, I remember I told to you here in this lesson, we are not going into the details of the discussions on the tenses, right? Now, grammatical category, these are the grammatical categories we are uh, talking about, right? In this lesson, uh, the tenses, category of tenses, category of voice, category of aspect, and category of mood. Tense and aspect both are uh, occurring together, right? You know about tense and aspect. 
and uh, then uh, active and passive voice you have some idea about that also talking about english grammar and then mood when we talk about sentences uh, especially about the simple sentences we talk about different moods available there okay so these are some of the major grammatical categories you need to be aware of when we talk about english okay the grammar of the english language because we are dragging examples from the english language whatever the discussions we are doing here so then when we talk about the grammatical categories here in relation to the english language we are going to talk okay then i told you uh, during the previous discussion uh, in this lesson we are not going to talk in detail about the tenses right there are 12 tenses when you talk about the active voice four aspects and three tenses four aspects and all together 12 right uh, and talking about the passive voice there are eight we are not going to elaborate that much only thing is uh, you are given the basic idea regarding what sort of categories these are that's all okay what sort of grammatical categories what you mean by these tense aspect mood voice that is all right in detail the uh, the like uh, you know more information about the tenses and voices and mood right so therefore we will stick into the basic information and sometimes uh, certain grammatical categories we are discussing here you may be looking at them from a different point of view earlier you must have learned them and if there are teachers among you you may be teaching these things to your students right in your classes or in your schools but but still check whether you are looking at these grammatical categories in the same perspective we are using here right okay the grammatical category of tense when we talk about the tense uh, you know about the tense actual tenses are the basics in english grammar okay you can't talk anything about uh, uh, sentence constructions without uh, uh, thinking about the tenses right yeah so then what do you mean by tense tense is actually the time right so it's a grammatical category that locates a situation in time when we write a sentence using a particular tense means we are locating a situation in a particular time frame okay which means uh, we are talking about when the situation or action or happening takes place. When, when, the time. That is the focus of the word tense, right? In languages which have tense, it is usually indicated by a verb or a model verb. Now, when you talk about the English language, actually, how do we show the tense? We, we are infecting the base form of the verb, okay? Often combined with categories such as aspect, mood, voice, right? Now, we don't show tense only, you know. We don't, you especially, uh, like when we talk about uh, present tense, right? Present tense, you form any sentence. So, that belongs to uh, either of the four aspects of the present tense, if you consider, for example, about the present tense, right? When you write a sentence in the present tense, it belongs to either to the simple aspect, that means present simple or present continuous or present perfect or present perfect continuous. Likewise, there are four different aspects available in all the three tenses. For whatever sentence we write, definitely uh, it belongs to a particular tense, particular aspect, not only that, particular voice, there are two voices, either active or passive. So whatever a sentence we construct would be either active or passive. There are no uh, voices in between, right? No neutral voices, either active or passive. At the same time, it falls onto a particular mood category. Okay. It falls onto a particular mood category like indicative mood or interrogative mood, imperative mood etc okay so th that is why here, uh, here we say uh, when we uh, talk about uh, the construction of sentences right 
in a particular tense, we specially pay our attention to the, the verb inflection. Okay, now think about the English language. Here I have given typical tenses are present, past and future. Typical tenses means typical time frames. Like we have the present time, we have the past time and the future time. Accordingly, we have present tense, past tense and future tense. Right. How do you show these tenses in English? How? In, uh, in English language, how do you show? Okay. Present tense, we use the... Okay, you tell me. I will just listen if anybody is willing to... How do you show the present tense in the English language? I'm asking the basic uh, question in English grammar. Okay. Yeah. And please don't let the time pass so quickly. We have a lot of discussions today to be done. Yeah, anybody? How can we show the, uh, the present tense in the English language? If, because everybody knows English. Can I expect an answer from any one of you? No idea. Present tense. Now don't think that this is a grammar lesson, right? This is not a grammar lesson. We, we show the present tense in the English language by changing the verb, okay? By uh, doing some modifications to the verb. And according to the, the terms, we say by inflecting the verb. Inflecting. How? Right. If it is the, the plural number, if the subject is the plural, then we use present tense, okay? I am talking about the present, specially aspect, simple present simple then we put the base form of the verb along with the plural subject but if the subject is singular then what will happen how do we inflect the verb adding s we add s right we inflect the base form of the verb by adding s if the uh, subject is singular so that happens in the present simple sentence but if the sentence is present continuous then that's something else if the sentence is present perfect still something else right then we are doing all these changes to the verb we are inflecting the verb either we add s or we add ed to make it past participle or we add, or past form or we add ing to make the verb progressive likewise there are so many inflections done to the verb Right? Or sometimes we uh, combine a model verb along with the, uh, the main verb, model verb. Especially, uh, you need to be aware of these uh, verb inflections to show the time differences, right? And now, in English language, I'm talking about the English language only here, present tense and the past tense to form the present tense sentences and past tense sentences we inflect the verb either we add s or ed or ing depending on the particular aspect we inflect the base form of the verb but how do you show the future tense future tense in english do you inflect the verb no we are using will yeah simple future for example simple future we combine a model verb model auxiliary verb with the base form will will come or shall come okay so that's the difference here uh, sometimes you must have heard there are only two tenses there are two tenses only there is a view there because the, that is not a wrong view. It is said because there are only two grammatical tenses. Talking about the English language, there are only two grammatical tenses because only the present and past tense can be uh, formed by inflecting the verb. But we don't have any verb inflections to indicate the future tense. Instead of changing the verb or inflecting the verb, what do we do? We add the model auxiliary to the base form. Therefore, future tense is not normally considered to be a grammatical tense. Grammatical tense, right? 
so when you are reading or when you are doing some references if you meet that idea like there are two tenses in english language you don't have to confuse that idea is given with the uh, the notion that there are two grammatical tenses present and past other than that uh, there are three tenses which means there are three different time frames okay in any language okay hope you got that uh, idea talking about this uh, grammatical category of tense and talking about the aspect right uh, you know about aspect there are four different aspects simple continuous perfect and perfect continuous actually what do you mean by this one it expresses how an action event or state denoted by a verb relates to the flow of time how a particular action or event relates to the flow of time. Whether the action is happening at the time of speaking or whether it has happened already by the time of speaking about that action, etc. So likewise, how that particular action flows through time. Okay. That is the idea behind the aspect. The basic aspectual distinction is the difference between perfective and imperfective aspects. Yeah, Sometimes these terms may be new to you, but be familiar. When we talk about the aspects, there are two major categories, perfective and imperfective aspects. Two major categories. Now, you know, already four aspects are there. But basically, we can go for these two uh, types, right? So, what do you think about perfective aspects? Idea is given here. Perfective aspect is used to referring to an event conceived as bounded and unitary, okay? Without reference to any flow of time during it. Without reference to any flow of time during it. Like, I helped him. I helped him. Do you find any, any kind of uh, sense related to duration of the action? Right? Duration? No, nothing like that. Okay? It just says, I helped him. This belongs to the past tense. <clears throat> uh, it doesn't say that when I was helping him, like whether I had helped him. Right? I just helped him. The action is kind of perfect it doesn't indicate any flow or, or kind of duration happening right so these sort of uh, aspects are identified as perfective perfective aspects but the opposite is imperfective aspect so this aspect is used for situations conceived as existing continuously opposite of perfective existing continuously or repetitively when the with the flow of the time like i was helping him right you can easily understand this example this uh, is a progressive action progressive aspect continuous aspect past continuous i was helping him there I, clearly it says a duration right uh, if you want, you can add adverbials to understand it this uh, more clearly. Like uh, last month, I was helping him for, uh, for two weeks. Last month, I was helping him for two weeks. Like that. So you can clearly uh, understand there is a, a duration indicator. Right. Whenever we use uh, continuous aspects, there is this duration indicated, imperfective, right? And I used to help people. This is also another example, but you don't find any uh, uh, progressive aspect there. I used to help people. I used to help people. Okay. Uh, so these are the two major types of aspects. Perfective and imperfective. If you were not familiar with these terms, better to be familiar now, right? Because usually when we discuss English grammar, uh, we uh, directly talk about the four types of aspects with their details, talking about the nature, 
right? Uh, how a simple aspect looks like and what kind of uh, aspect do we mean by continuous, perfect, etc. We explain like that, but here these two are only the two major divisions, right? Okay. Further distinctions can be made, for example, to distinguish states and ongoing actions like uh, continuous and progressive aspects from repetitive actions. Repetitive actions means habitual actions. Continuous, progressive aspects, continuous or progressive, both are the same, as well as repetitive actions. That means a habitual. Habitually, when a person is doing something as a habit, uh, we say that's habitual, right? Uh, so that sort of uh, aspects, that sort of actions also comes under imperfective aspect. So this is about the imperfective category. But you need to understand perfecting means by the time of talking, it is over, right? Uh, it is over and also it doesn't, the action itself does not give us any idea about the continuation or duration of the happening, okay? That sense is not available in perfective. So that's the major division, right? Talking about the aspects and you need to refresh your understanding and knowledge about the four uh, types of aspects, right? So that's quite common. Usually, you know about that. And what do you think about the mood, grammatical category of mood? Are you familiar with moods? Usually, you know about tense, aspect and voice, right? Mood. Mood is there now on screen. You can uh, see. Right? Yeah, let's go to the beginning. Uh, grammatical mood is a grammatical feature of verbs used to signal modality. That means it is the use of verbal inflections, right, that allows speakers to express their attitude towards what they are saying. Attitude towards what they are saying. The term is used more broadly to allow for the syntactic expression of modality, right? Syntactic expression of modality. You know, uh, you must have uh, earlier met somewhere the word modality, the word modality, right? Modality means expressing the attitude or personal view, opinion towards what the speaker is telling, right? Modality. Usually, you know, in English grammar, we use model auxiliary verbs to show the modality, right? We use model auxiliary verbs to show the modality like can, could, may, might, would, uh, and also need to, ought to, dare, right? So these are the model auxiliaries and we use a particular model auxiliary according to what we want to express, right? According to our perspective uh, towards the content of our sentence, we use the particular model auxiliary web. So that's the modality which you usually know, right? But now here we are talking about mood, grammatical mood. Grammatical mood is also something which you use to express your modality, which means your attitude, what you feel, what you want to do, or what you want to get done by the other person. Okay. Uh, there we identify it as syntactic expression of modality. Syntactic, you know, syntactic means grammar, right? Grammatical. Grammatical expression of modality takes place with the Mood, okay, right? The use of non-inflectional phrases, right? Okay, uh, we'll see. Mood is distinct from grammatical tense or grammatical aspect, although the same word patterns are used to express more than one of these meanings at the same time in many languages, including English and most other modern Indo-European languages, right? Yeah. 
hope you can follow this uh, idea right as simple ideas but you need to uh, basically understand what you mean by mood here okay right uh, these are some examples of mood uh, usually we use this right indicative mood interrogative mood imperative emphatic subjunctive injunctive potential likewise different moods are available okay right I am not going to, uh, as I earlier told to you, I am not going into the, the, the details. I am introducing some of the terms and how they can be uh, understood from a grammatical point of view. Yeah. Okay, further details uh, are up to you to be sure of. Or if you don't have, if you just think that you don't have an idea about, for example, active, passive or any mood, then it is your responsibility and the duty to go for further uh, uh, points, right? For informations and uh, read more and be more and more familiar, right? I'm introducing the grammatical categories here only. Okay, right. Now, this is the next grammatical category called voice. You know about voice. There are two voices, no active and passive. Right. Can someone uh, tell me the difference between these two voices? Any uh, simple in simple terms, right? What's the difference between active and passive voice? Anybody volunteer? Anybody can talk. The subject is the mm. doer called mm. active voice mm. and passive voice is, is done by someone. Done by someone. Okay. Any other idea? Anything different? What about the other students? You all are just uh, quietly listening or oh, you are not there in the meeting? I don't know. The voice of a verb. In grammar, the voice of a verb. What do you mean by uh, after all voice? Voice of a verb describes the relationship between the action that the verb expresses and the participants identified by its arguments. Right? Relationship between verb, verb in the sense the action, or it can be a state as well, right? Mostly action and also uh, the participants identified by the arguments of the sentence like subject and object so these are the participants that are related to the verb no so voice means the the particular relationship between the action and the its participants action and its participants which means subject and object so what kind of a relationship is there between the action and the subject action and the object that relationship decides whether the sentence is in active voice or passive voice. So then uh, when you talk about the difference, right? Okay, we'll go to this line also. When the subject is the agent or doer of the action, the verb is in the active voice. So uh, when we talk about a sentence, right? Uh, the position, subject position, you know, the verb position and the object position. These are the three main positions. Now, if the verb is a transitive verb, then in the subject position, usually we put the doer, right? Usually we put the doer, and in the verb position, we have we put the action, right? And in the object position, what does come? In the object position, recipient of the action, the person or the thing that receives the action. Normally, this is actually normally means the default order. 
this is how usually we see the doer is placed in the subject position and then verb and then only we uh, locate the receive right? recipient receive of the action this is inactive voice we say right this is the active voice right but when we uh, construct a sentence in the passive voice then what will happen right because now there are reasons for us to go for uh, uh, passive right all the time we are not using passive you know we we actually prefer to use passive when we are not any more interested in the doer Rather than the doer, if we are interested or if we want to emphasize what happened to the recipient, then we are promoting the recipient to the subject position. We want to talk about the recipient and we want to tell what happened to the recipient. Who did we are not interested? Right? Doer, we don't care. In such situations, we use passive. Okay, then uh, when we construct a passive sentence, what will happen? Usually at the very beginning, the subject position is there, no, right? Any sentence. Then in the passive sentence, uh, to the subject position, what does come? Recipient. Recipient comes to the subject position and then the action is there, but grammatical changes are there, right? From uh, when we are converting uh, active sentence to passive sentence, the verb press changes, you know, right? So that change you need to be aware of. Then and that's all, right? Recipient and action. And if you want, you can still have the chance to talk about the doer by shifting it to the prepositional place starting with by. That is the nature of passive there. Passive. Passive. Okay. So that's the idea given here. Uh, when the subject is the, the patient, uh, sorry, earlier. When the subject is the agent or doer of the action, the verb is in the active voice. Like this red. Okay. And when the subject is the patient or target or undergoes uh, of the action, that means the recipient in other words, the verb is said to be in the passive voice as I have indicated in blue color, right? So, for example, the cat chased a rat. The cat is the doer, chased, past tense, simple past, a rat, recipient. Okay, that is active because why? The, the, the one who does the action is there in the subject position, the cat. But uh, we can convert this into the passive voice if we are interested to talk about the rat there. Then a rat was chased. That's all. A rat was chased. But if you want, you can say by the cat. That is the simple difference between simple and uh, the major difference between active and passive, but still you need to uh, know, okay? You need to be familiar with the fact that in uh, voice, right? By voice, what do you mean? Actually voice means we talk about the relationship between the action and the other elements. Other elements means participants of the, uh, argument argument you don't have to take the word too serious actually right uh, participants of the action so that is subject and object but these two are participating in two different ways right subject object positions in active voice that's different and when you talk about the passive voice totally different okay so voice is something like this and uh, you uh, might know right you Definitely, you know about the, the different sentence constructions according to the tense, passive sentence construction. There are eight different passive sentences, passive structures, although uh, 12 active uh, constructions are there. When you talk about passive, there are eight only. So you need to have clear, 
clear understanding about that grammar part. Okay, when you are talking about the grammatical category of words. Okay, right. Then uh, the other uh, basic area in English grammar is the word classes. You know, uh, usually we start our discussions of grammar anywhere in any class with word classes. Because word classes are the basics in English grammar. Here you can find some categories of word classes. Okay, I'm not going to do, discuss anything about word classes like uh, uh, the adjective, noun, adverb, uh, 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 sorry, verb, open word class and close word class, pronoun, conjunction, determiner, what are they doing, their differences. I'm not going to talk about that aspect. Instead, you can see uh, some categories of word classes here. Okay, how we can categorize or identify word classes on which basis. You can find several uh, uh, categories here. Semantic, right? Semantic, uh, we can classify the word classes according to semantic criteria. You know, semantic means meaning. No? Then the semantic criterion presupposes the evaluation of the generalized meaning which is characteristic of all the subsets of words constituting, constituting a given part of speech, right? This meaning is understood as the categorical meaning of the part of speech, categorical meaning. That means uh, semantic criterion, simply you need to understand the meaning, the meaning of the, uh, the particular category of words. Okay, uh, like semantic meaning. We say in other words, lexical meaning. Okay, so usually you can find uh, uh, in the traditional four parts of speech, right? Nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. They contain the semantic meaning. Okay, we can identify that semantic element from the open word class uh, elements. As I said, noun, verb, adjective, adverb. So that is semantic criterion is one particular criterion which we can use to recognize word classes. Okay, right. that is one. And second one, the formal criterion. Formal, uh, here formal, don't uh, mess this with the word formal, right? This has to do with form actually. The word formal, comes from form, right? Okay. You know about the word form, F-O-R-M, form, which is different from function. Formal criterion provides for the exposition of the specific inflectional and derivational features. Inflectional and derivational, that means word building features of all the lexemic subsets of a part of speech, right? So, by using the formal criterion, how do we categorize the words into classes? We identify their internal structure. Internal structure. Right? In morphology, you have uh, touched this. You have uh, discussed this. Inflectional uh, morphemes and derivational morphemes. How a word is formed uh, by adding prefixes and suffixes to the root. Okay. So, so that aspect talks about the, the internal structure of words, the form of words. Okay, right. So that is another different criterion, which we call formal criterion here, which is different from semantic criterion. In the semantic criterion, we were identifying or recognizing word classes based on the meaning. But uh, according to the formal criterion, we recognize the word classes based on their form. That means based on their superficial structure, formation. Right? Okay. And then functional criteria. This concerns the syntactic role of words. In the sentence, typical of a part of speech, right? Syntactic role of words. Function means what... what the words are doing in a sentence function. So this doesn't have anything to do with the form actually, right? 
what the words are doing, whether the word is functioning as the subject or object or verb, right, or adverbial or as complement. Like that, these are the five main elements of a sentence. So what, what is the, the syntactic role? And also uh, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, how these uh, uh, words, right, function inside a sentence as sentence components. That is the aspect discussed under functional criteria. Functional. In simple terms, actually, function means the role or the work right, performed by a particular word. And then if you are classifying words according to the, uh, the, the role uh, they are uh, playing, that we do according to the functional criteria. That's the idea. Okay. So the set three factors of categorical characterization of words are conventionally referred to as respectively meaning, form, and function. Already you know about these three terms, actually. Right? I did not cut the... Sorry. Right. Okay. Right? These are the three words which you need to be familiar when you are classifying words into subclasses. Actually, I'm not talking about the two main word classes only here, open and closed. Inside them also, we can go for further categories based on the meaning, form and function. Okay, so these three are very important criteria when we talk about the classification of words. Right, okay, that's the idea I wanted to give you under the uh, subtopic word classes, right? Okay, that is uh, what I uh, wanted to discuss under grammatical categories, right? Grammatical categories and I told you this is not a lengthy lesson. Uh, although there are a few slides and a small uh, note available for you, understand behind that there's uh, a lot, okay? You, you have to have... Uh, a very broad understanding and knowledge about grammar, English grammar. Although superficially, you have a very small note available here. Right? Okay. Well, then I'm going to wind up and switch on to our next lesson. Right. Okay, right. Uh, this is semantics and uh, I thought of discussing semantics too because in this module you talk about the, the linguistic structure of modern English, right? Linguistic structure, when we talk about the linguistic structure, actually it includes phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax which we were discussing up to now and finally semantics too but don't think that uh, we are going to an in-depth discussion on semantics you know semantics is itself is a very broad area right it's a very broad area uh, but here in this lesson i am going to uh, drag your attention to the most important elements right that are commonly discussed in semantics area. And some elements actually you may be already familiar with, I think. Okay, you might already know. But still you need to streamline what you know about semantics in this discussion. Right? Okay, I have already sent you the lecture materials of this lesson as well. Hope you have received. Okay, it's there in the group. Uh, Okay, so these are the areas of discussion. I'm going to talk about the something about the traditional semantics and uh, semantic relationships, only basic semantic relationships and semantic features and ending the discussion with prototypes. Okay, right. So in order uh, for you to uh, be familiar, right, be familiar with this, uh, topic right just I'll give you one or two minutes to go through these lines now here we are starting our discussion on semantics with traditional semantics 
right now this is an overview of traditional semantics and there you have lexical semantics sentence semantics discourse semantics these key key uh, terms are there so i'll give you uh, oh, two minutes like two or three minutes go through the first part of the note right and be familiar and still if you are thinking about grammatical categories or any other thing just keep them away okay and be clear clear up your minds to talk about semantics right for that transition i'm give you i'm going to give you uh, two three minutes time okay be familiar with this part and if you have more time then you can just go through the rest of the note as well then it will be really easy for you to catch up the points during the discussion right okay
Okay. Overview of traditional semantics. That means a very brief introduction to traditional semantics. Right? Hope you must have uh, gone through this area and uh, you have some idea now. Okay. Traditional semantics is the study of linguistic meaning. Right? Study of meaning. Now, usually we say semantics is the study of meaning. That's the idea behind the word traditional semantics too, right? Study of linguistic meaning. That means study of the meaning of the particular linguistic item, either a word or a sentence, focusing on how words and sentences convey meaning, right? It emphasizes the idea that word meanings arise from social consensus and usage, right? rather than from a single definitive meaning. Okay, word meanings. Always the meaning of a word is related or is associated with social factors and the usage of that word, rather than talking about single or definitive meaning. That idea is there inside this traditional semantics, right? Okay, when we talk about traditional semantics, there are particular concepts like lexical semantics, sentence semantics, and discourse semantics. Okay, with the primary focus on the relationship between words, their meanings, and their usage in language. You must have read about these three concepts also, right? So what do you mean by lexical semantics? Lexeme means words. So lexical semantics is related to the words, word meanings, study of word meanings. That is what you mean by lexical semantics, focusing on how words relate to each other and their meanings within a language. Okay, how one word is related to another word on the basis of meaning and uh, altogether they are meanings, right? In a language. Word meaning, in short, actually, lexical semantics uh, talks about the word meaning. And sentence semantics, it talks about the meanings of sentences, right? Sentence meaning and the structure of phrases, analyze their syntactic arrangements and interpretations. How uh, uh, the meaning of a sentence can be understood or can be interpreted in relation, okay, in relation to the uh, arrangement of words also, syntactic arrangements by analyzing the syntactic. Now, you know, syntactic arrangement means grammatical arrangement, right? Okay, that means subject, verb, object, subject, uh, uh, verb, subject, verb, complement, subject, verb, uh, adverbial, like there are sentence patterns there. Syntactic arrangement is that, right? The grammatical arrangement of the sentence component. So in sentence semantics, actually, we don't uh, talk about the syntactic aspect of sentence. That means grammatical aspect. We talk about the meaning, how meaning is expressed. How do we do so? How do we study the meaning? By analyzing the syntactic arrangements. By analyzing or by understanding or by studying how uh, a sentence is constructed by using sentence components. Then what sort of meaning is conveyed? That is always the goal in semantics. In sentence semantics, then we uh, pay our attention to what sort of meaning is brought out or we, can we interpret by looking at the structure of a sentence, right? Okay, discourse semantics. This involves larger units of language, units larger than sentence. Right? Discourse semantics analyzes how meaning is constructed in longer text. In longer text and conversation context beyond individual sentences. So this goes according to an order, right? Starting with word, then sentence, and then discourse. So discourse, as you can understand, it talks about anything, any text that is longer than a sentence, beyond a sentence, it can be a paragraph, 
or it can be a book chapter, right? Or it can be a dialogue, a conversation, several lines, right? A dialogue or conversation consists of several different lines. So that sort of a longer text, then overall meaning of that, overall meaning of the text is what you mean by discourse semantics. Okay, so to understand the overall meaning of a text, we need to analyze that text into its parts. In discourse analysis, that is what we are doing, right? Why analyze the uh, text into uh, small parts and try to uh, understand these parts, their meanings. Right, okay, hope you got some understanding about these different uh, types of traditional semantics. Right, so in uh, the area uh, semantics, in the broad area which we call semantics, we deal with all these three types actually, right? We talk about the word meaning, we talk about sentence meaning, and also we talk about discourse meaning, right? Discourse semantics, but mostly word meaning and sentence meaning. They are the commonly touched areas uh, in discussions on semantics, right? Okay. Yeah. So, hope you got some uh, basic understanding about uh, traditional semantics. Then we have this uh, semantic relationships. When we talk about semantics, actually, this semantic, or oh, there's another word, lexical, right? Whenever we talk about uh, semantics, this is an unavoidable area, okay? Semantic relationships. And you know this uh, with the term lexical relationships. Are you familiar with the term lexical relationships? Le or lexical relations? Familiar? That's simply yes, no question. Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. Are you all listening? Can you hear what I'm telling? Yes, ma'am. Other than Sumaya? Yes. What about the other students? Can any other person hear me? Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Hmm. But you are keeping very silent and I don't know whether you are understanding what I am telling here. Right? No response, nothing. That is not the way, of course, you should uh, participate in a lecture. And then and then I am asking simple questions, so you need to respond actually. Okay, don't keep quiet uh, thinking that okay, let her talk and uh, uh, we can uh, simply watch or listen or you maybe mind in your own business at home, right? Um, under the impression that you can uh, check the recording later, right? Please don't uh, be with that sort of wrong misconceptions, right? If you log into the meeting, please actively participate in the discussions. Because uh, it will be good for you, not for me, actually. Yeah, I was asking about lexical relations. Uh, I just wanted to know whether you have any idea about that lexical relations. Any idea? Our topic here is semantic relationship, but I was asking about lexical relations. Familiar or not? Yes or no? Simple question. Yes. Hmm. Because uh, usually we talk about uh, synonymy, antonymy, hyponymy, polysemy, homophony, right? So these are the lexical relations. And uh, that is the same thing here we talk as or we discuss as semantic relationships also. It's the same thing. 
then what do you mean by semantic or lexical relations semantic relationships are the associations that exist between the meanings of words between the meanings of phrases or between the meanings of sentences now usually we talk about the uh, the meaning relationships that exist among the words or between the words and the lexical relations for example uh, synonyms we identify as uh, a particular semantic relationship between two words that is related to the similarity right if both words are similar in meaning we say there is a synonymous relationship and opposite of it antonyms antonyms are the two words right that are opposite in meaning okay usually we associate lexical relations or semantic relations with words with word meanings but still you can go beyond that right we can uh, again talk about the meanings of phrases and uh, meanings of sentences too in uh, semantic relationships right there are basic uh, semantic relations you can find synonymy that means semantic relations constitute similarities then we talk about synonymy and differences different semantic relations means actually opposite antonymy then if we are talking about hierarchical structures that is hyponymy okay you oh, i hope you have some uh, knowledge about the synonymy antonymy of course you know but what do you think about hyponymy any clear idea about this we are going to talk about but not in very detail right see okay we will touch uh, some of the basic semantic relationships hyponymy is there yeah okay we will talk about this with some uh, examples too then you can refresh uh, your knowledge right hmm. now actually here topic is bit different impact of different types of semantic relationships on understanding language that is the focus of our discussion right now here uh, we are not simply talking about synonymy antonymy hyponymy etc we are paying our attention to how to what extent these different semantic relationships can have an impact or can influence on understanding language to what extent are they important okay to what extent are they important or whether they have any impact and to what extent they can influence uh, on understanding the language by a person so that is the focus of this discussion here so first of all you know about synonymy right words with similar meanings we are talking about these uh, semantic relationships in relation to words okay in relation to words uh, then uh, synonymy means words with similar meanings like big and large small tiny pretty beautiful right house home to some extent right words with similar meanings then what is the impact synonymy has on language or on understanding language why are synonymy or synonymous relationships that important enhances understanding by allowing flexibility in word choice and enriching language if you have right just think about yourself if you have a very good understanding of synonyms right if you have a good vocabulary which means you may know a lot of synonyms then uh, it will be uh, kind of uh, adding uh, color to your knowledge of the language right it will your knowledge on synonymy will enhance understanding of the language right by allowing flexibility in word choice flexibility in word choice means you have a lot of options 
to express an idea right you may have a lot of words in your mind how because you know right you know the synonyms then you can go for one word or any other word if you don't like one word you can go for any other synonymous word you have the flexibility in selecting words and that will enrich your language that will add color also to your language right so that is the advantage that is the sort of impact having the knowledge of synonymy can have on your language use okay do you uh, follow the point here is that clear here we are talking not simply talking about what is synonymy what is antonymy no they are importance right importance of knowing synonyms and antonyms and so and so right antonymy antonymy is the uh, the name of the relationship uh, opposite relationship antonymy and you know antonyms are the uh, the words with opposite meanings like hot and cold, good and bad, right? Uh, tall and short, words with opposite meanings, right? Pretty and ugly, etc. Okay, so what do you think about the importance of antonymy then? If you know antonyms, right? If you know a lot of antonyms, it will help, right? You in uh, uh, using contrasting ideas or in expressing contrasting ideas and clarifying meanings and providing a fuller understanding of concepts, having the knowledge of antonyms, right, will benefit you in these ways. Whenever you want to contrast an idea, when you want to go uh, opposite, to an existing idea then you will have a lot of uh, options with uh, your knowledge of antonyms and also not only that right as uh, early also i was reading clarifying meanings and you can provide the full understanding of certain concepts right you can get an understanding also if you have antonyms in your mind stop right okay and uh, then hyponymy Next, semantic relationship. Hyponymy, what do you think about this? This is a hierarchical relationship, right? Where one word is a more specific term than the other word. Okay, if you just consider two words here, okay, you can arrange these two words in, a, in an order. In a, hierarchy means in an order, right? If one word comes at a uh, like uh, super level okay at a more general level and if the other word belongs to that earlier word then we can identify there is a hierarchical relationship right if one word can be incorporated to the meaning of the other word there is a hierarchical relationship between these two to, for that happen, okay, for that to happen, uh, with the given two words, one word should be a more specific term and the other word should be a more general term. You can easily understand this with the example, rose and flower, right? Rose is the hyponym of flower. Now, what do you think about the relationship between the two words, rose and flower? There are so many flowers and rose is only one type of flower. Okay, then what is the more general term? Okay, you tell me. The more general term, is it rose or flower? Rose. More general term. Flower. That is flower. Okay, because inside flower, you can put rose, not only rose, so many other types of flowers. Then more specific term is rose, more general term is flower. Okay, right? Okay, uh, tell me this, 
uh, animal and uh, rabbit. The two words I give you are one word is animal, the other word is rabbit. Okay, what is the more specific term? Rabbit. Rabbit is a specific term and the more general term is animal. animal. Yeah, we can include rabbit under animal category. Right, but uh, other than rabbit, there are more animals available, no? Right. So then uh, these two words, animal and rabbit, rose and flower, these words are in a hierarchical relationship. So we say there is a hyponymous relationship between these words. Okay. Then how does it help us process language or understand uh, the language? If you have a clear understanding and knowledge about hyponyms available in the English language, right? Then what are the advantages? It will help you categorize and improve comprehension of broader concepts, right? You would be able to easily understand the categories and subcategories of words. And it will help you improve your knowledge on more broad concepts and general concepts and more general concepts. Concepts here means uh, simply uh, the concepts of words, right? And uh, what are the uh, more specific words and which word uh, come under which word category likewise? This hierarchical sense, that knowledge you can get if you know Hyponyms. If you are aware of the uh, hyponyms available in the language, in the English language. Yes, that is the benefit of knowing that. Right. And hyponymy. Ah, okay. Uh, here I forgot to tell you hyponymy and hyponymy are two terms which you find in the same concept. Okay. Right. Same concept. Here we identify uh, hyponymy, right? Hyponymy is the uh, rose. Rose is a hyponym of flower, which means the most specific term is called hyponym. Hyponym, right? See the spellings. More specific term is hyponym. And uh, opposite of hyponym is hypernym. Hypernym, uh, according to our early example, flower. The more general term is hypernym. The a general term that encompasses more specific instances, right? Animal for dog and cat. Now, in this one, uh, what is animal? Hypernymy or hyponymy? That's the difference between one single letter and sound, okay? Hypernym. Hyponym. Hyponym is the more specific term. Hypernym is the more general term. And what is animal then? Hypernym. 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 Right? Whereas dog and cat are hyponyms. They are the more specific terms. Hyponyms. Right? Okay. So knowing about hyponym as well as hyponym, right, uh, facilitates understanding of relationships within categories. So you can still get a clear understanding about the hierarchical relationships, how uh, one word is related to another word, on which basis, right? That idea you can get very clearly if you are aware of more and more hyponyms and hyponyms. Okay, right. So that is the argument here. And uh, meronym. Meronymy. Uh, I don't know whether this is familiar to you. This word is familiar. This is another semantic relationship actually. Right? We uh, identify this as a part to whole relationship. Part to whole. Okay. Now look at the example. Wheel is a part of car. So instead of telling car, you can say 
wheel. Hmm? Now, normally you are using the word wheel instead of telling three wheel, right? Am I correct? I, I, I took a wheel and I took a wheel and came. Actually, what is wheel? What is the meaning of the word wheel? Wheel is, is what do you mean in singular row there? Okay. That is what you mean by wheel. And you know, definitely even a three wheel or a car or whatever, there are wheels, no? But when you want to say, I took a three wheel, you might say, I took a wheel and came. Or you can say, uh, instead of car, you can use the word wheel. So there, there is this uh, relationship, part to whole relationship. Wheel is the part. Okay, the word wheel. Just imagine that I have given you wheel and car. These are the two words. Right. Wheel is the part. Then what is car? Car is the whole thing, complete thing. Right? Whole. So then if you are using wheel, right? Instead of car, says that uh, Meronymous relationship is there, a part to whole relationship. So this helps in understanding the structure of objects and their components. Structure, now normally there are so many objects there. So we can get a clear understanding about how these objects are made of, right? What are the parts, then how we can use these parts to indicate the whole thing. Normally, in using English language, we do so, right? And holonymy is the opposite of it. Opposite of meronymy, the whole to part relationship, right? Using car for wheel like that, okay? Right, now this is only one simple example taken uh, for you to understand the difference between these two, different semantic relationships, okay? Holonymy is not very common actually, right? Other than holonymy, we use meronymy uh, because um, there are so many instances where we use a part to indicate the whole. Rather than uh, using a whole to indicate the part, there may be situations, right? You can check and if you find any example, you can add it here. The importance of holonymy, it provides context for how parts relate to a whole aiding in comprehension, okay? Uh, it will help uh, improve the understanding of how different parts are related to a whole uh, in using either meronymy or holonymy, the same uh, impact, right? The same advantage is there, but uh, be familiar more and more because meronymy and holonymy are not very much discussed when we talk about lexical relations, right? The commonly discussed uh, relations are synonymy, antonymy, hypernymy, right? These are the commonest ones, but still these two are also there, okay? So be familiar now if you did not know early, but uh, just going through these lines is not enough, right? Just try to find more, uh, and have uh, more examples and uh, more points, more facts, okay? And there's another example I just remembered to talk about meronymy. Um, like this using hand, right? Mm, give me your hand, something like that. So using hand instead of body. Okay, it may not be 100% accurate to meronymy here, but uh, we use words in that sense as well. Okay, right. So it's up to you to go for more examples. Here I'm introducing you and especially uh, dragging your attention to why they are that important, right? The impact they create on language understanding. That is my focus. Polysemy, another one. Polysemy. Uh, ah, this is common, right? Polysemy is quite common like synonymy and antonymy. Here we talk about a single word with multiple meanings. Single word with multiple meanings. Like uh, the commonly used example uh, is bank. 
right now bank uh, same spelling same pronunciation but uh, two different meanings and these meanings are also not associated with each other right not related to each other one meaning of bank is a financial institution where we deposit and withdraw money and the other meaning is uh, banks in the river the sides of a river we we say bank so these two meanings don't have anything in common totally unrelated right that kind of words are uh, identified as polysemy okay uh, this require this requires contextual cues for accurate interpretation influencing clarity and understanding yeah polysemy you need to understand uh, with contextual cues with some hints right and guides provided by the context otherwise you can't guess the exact meaning right okay for you to understand uh, bank as a financial institute uh, that uh, clue should be provided in the context or in the sentence where the word bank is used otherwise you can never know whether you are talking about a financial institute or uh, any side of a river right okay then uh, metonymy metonymy another semantic relationship read that hmm. metonymy quite interesting uh, quite interesting thing okay actually this is identified as a figure of speech rather than uh, uh, like a semantic relationship right it's a figure of speech because you uh, are given a particular term right particular term but actually the real meaning intended is not the superficial meaning of that term something related to that term like look at the example the white house right the white house the term the white house is there and it indicates actually the u.s president now you can put this in a sentence like the white house uh, announced what uh, uh, uh. decrease of prices of goods and services example right the white house declared uh, the decrease of prices whatever then actually what do you mean by the white house do you think the White House can declare or the White House can talk? It's just a building. But here the White House is symbolizing the U.S. president. So rather than saying the U.S. president declared, we say the White House declared. So this way of using language is called metonymy, right? Metonymy. Did you understand metonymy? This, there's only one example, but I think this example is enough for you to get some idea about what this means. Okay, right? So why metonymy is that much uh, popular actually? People are using metonymy, right? This enriches language and can convey complex ideas succinctly. Yeah, even the complex ideas can be more effectively and directly uh, expressed by using metonymy and also it adds color to the language use right okay that is about uh, metonymy and right so these are some common semantic features actually i can't say common uh, because especially this one uh, meronymy and holonymy is not very commonly discussed but they are they are right all these semantic relationships are available in the language especially in english language they are they are people are using right okay so therefore it's not a uh, question of whether they are common or not you need to be familiar with these semantic relationships together with their meanings okay right then uh, we are coming to another topic on semantic features. In the discussion of semantics, 
we have to talk about semantic features also because this is uh, an area where we are talking about identifying features, features or characteristics of words. Okay, now this is quite interesting work. Hmm? Uh, look at this. Basic semantic features are a means of classifying individual properties of words. Right, identifying semantic features of a word means actually we classify the uh, the properties means characteristics of uh, the given words. That means conducting Componential analysis, right? Don't uh, bother too much with these terms. Componential analysis means we analyze the, uh, the components of a word. Okay, imagine I give you a single word, right? And I ask you to analyze it, not the grammatical analysis, right? I ask you to identify the semantic features available in that word. Then what do you mean by semantic features then? That is what we are going to pay our attention to here. Then componential analysis so that these can be compared to or contrasted with one another. Com in componential analysis actually, we either compare or contrast these semantic features to one another. Right? Uh, feature classification systems are usually binary and neutral, right? Okay. Uh, binary, you know, binary means uh, opposites, no? Two ends. So, binary can have two values, either plus or minus. Plus means it's available. Minus means it's not available. Binary means two ends. Either it is there or not there. Okay, so we can identify the semantic features of a particular word uh, in the sense whether these features or characteristics are available in that word or not available in that word. Like that. When we do uh, examples, you will understand, right? Fully. Sometimes there will be a third value, zero, neutral value also. There yeah, can be neutral value. Usually we have plus or minus, sometimes zero. Zero means we talk about, uh, uh, actually we don't relate it, right? We never talk about whether that uh, characteristic is available or not. It is not relevant at all. In that sense, we say neutral value indicated by zero, right? These are some typical uh, semantic features that are available in words, right? Typical, commonly used semantic features like animate, human, concrete, male, mature or adult, right? Instead of mature, we can say adult or use adult and married. These are some of the common semantic features, right? Now you have some examples. Bachelor. Bachelor is a word you have, right? You are given the word bachelor and you need to identify the semantic features of the word bachelor, right? You need to consider this list. These are the semantic features usually uh, that are uh, relevant to most of the words, right? Then the word is bachelor. No? Can you understand this? No. Bachelor, I have put plus male. Plus male means this male, the property called male is available in bachelor. So we, therefore we put plus male and plus mature and adult also because we never use the word bachelor to indicate a kid, no, uh, to indicate a child, right? So that is plus mature or adult and plus human. Bachelor is a human being, not an animal, right? Therefore plus human and plus animal. Plus concrete, this is a concrete noun, so plus concrete and uh, what? why uh, minus married? Because we never use the word bachelor to indicate a married person, right? To indicate a single person, you use the word bachelor. Therefore, minus married. These are the semantic features of the word bachelor. 
and all the time when you write semantic features, remember to use plus or minus or zero. Now zero is not relevant here. So all these semantic features are either plus or minus. Okay, let's see how uh, child is uh, analyzed the semantic features of child. They are uh, zero male because child we don't know whether that is uh, male or female male child or female child no? because we use the word child to indicate either a girl or a boy male child or female child right so we can't use plus or minus anything that is not uh, of course relevant here neutral so we put zero male right and minus mature or adult, you know, child is not an adult. So that is minus, not mature also. And that is plus human, plus animal, plus concrete and minus married again. You know, child can't be married, right? Minus married. And when you uh, identify the semantic features of daughter, see how uh, the semantic features are presented here. Minus male, you understand that, right? Daughter, we use the word daughter to indicate a girl child, right? So, therefore, minus male. And uh, what do you think about uh, why zero mature or adult is given? Because there can be small daughters, very young daughters, as well as uh, uh, like big daughters. Big daughters means uh, quite mature daughters also, right? So in that sense, uh, we can't apply uh, either plus or minus to the word mature. No? <clears throat> we can't apply. Therefore, zero. That's neutral. right? And plus human, plus animal, plus concrete. And again, uh, zero married. Zero married because daughter can either be married or unmarried, right? So therefore, we can't correctly say to the point, say minus married or plus married. It's zero. Yeah, right. Uh, may I know whether you got some idea about semantic features with these three examples? Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is how uh, this is how you should write the semantic features of a word given, right? And use this list. This is the the list of semantic features as I earlier also introduced that that's commonly used right okay yeah uh, right actually it's good that if we could do some uh, exercises but uh, the time problem is there so therefore I would move on to the discussion of prototypes but you can do this, right? Whenever you find a word, right, try to identify the semantic features. Any word you come across, right? You just write some words here and uh, try to identify the semantic features. But don't write these semantic features uh, without putting plus or minus or zero. You have to identify whether the particular property is available in the word. Then if yes, put uh, plus. If the particular property is not available, then put minus. And if the particular property is not applicable, not relevant, put zero. Okay. That is how you should write the semantic features. Okay. Right. Then this last uh, topic on prototypes. We call these prototypes. Uh, I'll give you around, uh, yeah, one or two minutes again, quickly go through this and uh, see whether you understand uh, what is meant by prototypes.
okay <clears throat> prototypes uh, right okay got some idea now just uh, roughly got familiarized this is the most typical or representative example of a category, right? Most typical or representative example of a category, prototype. Okay, we'll go through the note first. In linguistics, it's a central concept in prototype theory, right? Which is a way of understanding how people categorize and understand words in the attempt of understanding, right? The relationships that are existing between words, this prototype is a very important concept there, right? Where you can get some idea uh, about uh, how a single word can be used to represent a list of words behind. Right now, we'll see there is an example also. Yeah. Uh, while the words canary, cormorant, dove, duck, flamingo, parrot, pelican, and robin are all equally co hyponyms of the superordinate bird. Right now, you know about this hyponym and hyponym. Here, superordinate means the most general term, that means hyponym. Then what are these words? Canary, cormorant, all these uh, types of birds, no? Up to Robbie, right? All are the ones I have bracketed now. They are the different types of different species of birds. All are coming under bird category, right? Okay. But whenever you want to uh, select Imagine that you have to select one species of birds, one type of birds here from the bracketed list. Okay. Which word do you select to represent the bird category? So as a representing word of birds. What do you think? Canary, cormorant, some uh, the, uh, types you might not uh, be very much familiar in our country also in Sri Lanka, right? Parrot, pelican. Actually, it is said that robin. Robin is the most suitable type of birds, right? That can be used to represent bird category. Right now, all these co hyponyms are not all considered to be equally good examples of the category bird. Right, all are not equally good examples of the category bird. According to some researchers, the most characteristic instance of the category of bird is robin. So, whenever you say robin, right, your listener will understand more easily and more quickly you are talking about a bird. If you use the word robin rather than the word duck or flamingo or even parrot. Now, did you get some idea about prototype? Then a prototype is robin that uh, indicates or that can uh, effectively represent the birds. Okay. The idea of the characteristic instance of a category is known as prototype. The characteristic instance. Robin is the characteristic instance of birds. So this, this idea is uh, given as the prototype, right? The concept of a prototype helps explain the meaning of certain words like bird, not in terms of component features like now we are not talking about whether robin has feathers or whether it has wings, how many wings, how many feathers, right? We are not going to look at the inside of the word, right? But we try to identify uh, robin as the characteristic example of the bird category in terms of resemblance to the clearest example. Robin looks more like a bird. If we refer to the example here, Robin looks more like a bird, right? 
resemblance, similarity to the clearest example. Rather than a parrot, rather than a flamingo, right? Rather than a pelican or dove, Robin looks more like a bird. So therefore, Robin is the prototype. Okay, that is the idea behind prototypes. Okay, so you have so many examples, uh, more examples. Furniture, when you're talking about furniture, right? Is it a chair, bench or stool that can represent uh, furniture? Whenever you say, right, furniture, it would be chair, right? You would get the word chair to your mind first. Then the words bench or stool come to your mind, right? The word chair will come quickly, which means chair would represent, chair is a prototype representing furniture. And uh, like uh, when you are talking about clothing, between shoes and shirts, shirts, the word shirts will represent the word clothing than shoes. And when you are talking vegetable, Carrot would be more vegetable than potato or tomato. All are vegetables, right? Potato, tomato, carrot, all are vegetables. But carrot would be representing vegetable category more effectively than potato or tomato. Right. Okay. So carrot, shirts, chair. These are the prototypes representing the respective categories. Okay, there is a general pattern to the categorization process involved in prototypes and it determines our interpretation of word meaning, okay? Right, always prototypes are decided according to the, uh, the word meanings, the meanings of the words. But still there are some uh, clashes there, right? Uh, clashes means different uh, people, different individuals can understand these prototypes in different ways. This is one area where individual experience can lead to substantial variation right? in interpretation and people may disagree over the categorization of a word like avocado, tomato as fruit or vegetable. Right? Now, some people say avocado as a fruit and tomato as a vegetable. But there are some cultures, some countries where avocado and tomato both are treated as vegetables and also uh, as fruits, okay? So there are variations, there are variations depending on countries and cultures in identifying the prototype. You need to understand that. So re remember, identification of prototype is relative. That depends on uh, the, the cultural factors and also some other factors, particular to countries. Okay, these words seem to be treated as co-hyponyms of both fruit and vegetable in different contexts. Both uh, avocado and tomato can be fruit as well as vegetable. But for us, what do you think about avocado? Is it a vegetable? Avocado, is it vegetable? Do you consider it as a vegetable here in Sri Lanka? What do you think? Avocado is a fruit, okay? We do not consider it as a vegetable, but there are countries where it's considered to be a vegetable too. Whereas tomato, we usually consider to be a vegetable than a fruit. But there are countries where tomato is a fruit too. Okay, so therefore prototypes can differ. That's the point I wanted to tell at the end here. Prototypes can differ depending on the particular context. Right, okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, actually, I very quickly had the discussion on uh, these areas. Okay, this is a brief overview on traditional semantics, but I think I gave you uh, some basic understanding, right? You must have got a basic understanding about different semantic relationships, semantic features, and this particular concept called prototypes. But remember, when we talk about semantics, these are not the only components, okay? There are so many other areas related to the field of semantics, but I touched upon a very brief and commonest components only right if you have any 
thing to get clarified. Now these few minutes are for you. Uh, you have the time now, right? Yeah, any question or any problem you want to ask? It's the time. Why now today you are very silent, right? Anyway, if you are like getting these things clearly, then that's fine. But the thing is, I I'm clueless, right? When you are not talking, of course, I don't know whether you are even listening or understanding these things. That's my problem. But if you are following the, the points, then that's okay. Okay, do you have any question or anything to be asked at the end? Because I have uh, completed the number of hours and this is the last day. Uh, the module is over. Right. If you don't have any question or anything to raise, I will wind up the discussion. Right? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> good night, all of you. And I think uh, there will be in future some other modules, right? Where I will meet you. Okay. Until then, uh, see you. Good luck.